I'm back today to do another what I wish I would have known video and today I wanted to talk about the Goldilocks mastectomy and what I wish I would have known going into it the first time. I'm now pursuing getting a second Goldilocks mastectomy and I know a lot more now but the first time around I know I knew very very little and I didn't understand um, all of the complexities and Differences from doctor to doctor, surgeon to surgeon. Um, so I wanted to share those today now that I've learned them. So firstly, I wanted to share kind of what Goldilocks mastectomy is because I didn't fully understand it the first time I signed up for it. And I'm super grateful that my first surgeon brought it up as an option because I think it's an amazing option for those of us who don't want to get implants and don't want to have a bunch of fat taken out of our belly or our butt and have multiple very painful surgeries doing that. If you want a simpler surgical plan that doesn't leave you completely flat, but allows for a tiny bit of a mound, um, depending on how big your breasts are to begin with, Goldilocks is a really, really good option. What it does is it preserves all of your skin or as much of it as possible. And you use your skin as a layer of padding underneath the skin that's gonna show. For those who have like double D or larger breasts, it can create a, a quite a significant mound of skin instead of fat or implant material underneath the exterior part of your breast after mastectomy. And online, when you research Goldilocks mastectomy, like I did, it talks about it being an option for obese patients only. And the word obesity or obese patients, that seems to be pretty much linked um, in the online literature with the concept of Goldilocks. And that's not the case anymore. Maybe that's how it started, but nowadays you can be a C cup and get a Goldilocks and still have a slight mound, kind of the way that a thin man would have a little bit of a mound on his chest. Um, it's not gonna look like a voluptuous women's breast. If you have a C cup, it will be less than an A cup size for sure at that point. And if you have a D or a double D, then maybe it will be a full A cup size, depending on your surgeon. It really varies. But the concept of, of Goldilocks is open to a lot more women than it was originally considered to be um, an option for. And so that's something to know, especially as you're researching it online. The other thing I wish I would have known is I wish I would have known what those differences are in different surgeons. Some surgeons have outcome photos that are just gorgeous and very breast-like, and other ones have photos that are not as gorgeous. And so I would encourage you, if you're looking to do a Goldilocks, to get many second opinions and look for photographs and ask before you even see a plastic surgeon. It is the plastic surgeon that will likely do the Goldilocks and not your breast surgeon. Before you even meet with that plastic surgeon, um, make sure that they have done Goldilocks mastectomies on women your size before. It's been really hard for me to find, in my area at least, plastic surgeons who have done a Goldilocks mastectomy on women with uh, double D or smaller breast size. Most of them are doing um, Goldilocks procedures on obese women, and they have mostly pictures to show you of obese women. Those pictures are not going to be helpful for you if you have smaller breasts or medium-sized breasts. And so I would just encourage you to get photos. And also, um, another thing I wish I would have known is that some surgeons leave a layer of fat under the skin and some surgeons just use skin for their Goldilocks procedures. And so you might ask that question too because that's going to make a difference as to how much, of a, how much bulk there is underneath your mound, your outcome. Um, it's a little bit debated whether it's safe to use a layer of, flat, of fat because when you go to use a layer of fat um, for thin women, women with a smaller BMI, you might have less fat in some areas and more fat in other areas under your skin. And so, for example, in my body, in my situation, I have very little fat under my skin. And so what a lot of surgeons will do is they'll take a little bit of breast tissue as padding if they're used to using a layer of fat. Most surgeons who do a Goldilocks procedure on women, they're doing it on obese women who have plenty of fat underneath their skin. So they're used to kind of preserving an extra padding layer. And for me, I would rather not preserve any breast tissue. I would rather just stick with the skin and make it a smaller mound because preserving breast tissue increases your chances of recurrence. 
So I don't want to deal with chances of recurrence being increased. So I was looking not only for someone that could do uh, a Goldilocks on someone with a D-sized breast like my own or double D. Um, I was also looking for someone that only uses skin in their procedure, in their practice, and not fat. Something I just learned recently this year, way after I had my first Goldilocks trial, um, I didn't actually end up getting a Goldilocks the first time around, and I'll talk about that in a minute, but I learned that some surgeons are now even able to preserve nerves underneath the skin and inside of the skin um, and actually preserve your feeling while doing a Goldilocks procedure. And so that might be something you'll want to ask for too. I'm sure that that's pretty rare. Um, uh, the surgeon, plastic surgeon I'm going to up in Seattle that does that, her last name is Um, U-M. And she's the only one I've heard of that does that up here in the Northwest. So I'm sure on the East Coast that is a little bit more likely to find, but maybe not. I think most people get training like that probably over on the East Coast and not as much on the West Coast. So that might be something to ask for too. And I sure would have liked to know about that my first time around. Another thing you can preserve is the nipple if you would like to. What they do with the Goldilocks is they cut out your nipple, cut around it, and then they sew it back on when they're all done forming the overlapped skin breast mound. So you will not have a nipple that has nerves intact. You will not have a nipple that is still attached to your actual skin the way it was before. But you can find a lot of photos online of nipples that have been sewn back on in a circle around the nipple or the areola. And it usually looks pretty good because even if you have scarring, the scarring is usually pink and it matches your areola and so it doesn't look bad, but it's not going to preserve your nipple sensation, which is kind of for me the most, the, the biggest win or the biggest point of preserving the nipple would be to preserve the nerves in the nipple, um, your sensation of cold and hot and touch. And you won't have that if you have uh, Goldilocks with nipple preservation. The other thing about nipple preservation is that sometimes it doesn't work and your nipple tissue dies and it's pretty common to have nipple necrosis and then you have something that looks a little odd after that uh, tissue death and so I'm opting to not preserve my nipple and I'm totally fine with that. Uh, I think it would be better to have just smooth skin instead of kind of a scar that is in the shape of an areola with no nipple there in the end. So that's how I'm doing it, but a lot of people have asked to preserve their nipple and have done well. So like I said, my first time around I asked for a Goldilocks and I was pretty happy to be getting one. In the end, after they cut into me in surgery, they found that a lot of my skin had calcifications in it and so they were not able to do the Goldilocks. They had to cut out more skin than they had uh, thought that they would have to. And so the biggest thing that I regret in my first surgery planning process is not having a clear and written plan for if the Goldilocks was not achievable, if I could not achieve a Goldilocks. Um, I did tell my surgeons that I wanted to be as flat as possible, so they knew that as a backup plan. They did not follow that backup plan, unfortunately. Um, so I was pretty clear, but I definitely would look for a plan in writing, and I will do so with my second Goldilocks mastectomy coming up here. Um, if you've seen my prior videos saying that I was just about to get one, it's, it was canceled and was put off three months, so I'm still waiting to get it. But yeah, I would definitely come up with a backup plan if it's something goes wrong, they can't preserve your skin, and they can't do the Goldilocks. They will want to know whether to preserve enough skin to do an implant in that case, or perhaps create a false nipple, which they tried to do with me, and I had never asked for that, so I was pretty shocked to find that they had done that. Um, or if you just want flatness as um, a result of your failed Goldilocks um, procedure. So yeah, that is something I can definitely say with certainty that I regret, and I would encourage you to plan for the worst. If, um, if you're getting a Goldilocks. You just don't know what they're gonna find in your skin when they cut in, and, and especially if you have DCIS and calcifications close to the skin, there's a possibility they will not be able to preserve your skin. I ended up with a little lump, and I think what I'm gonna do is have a type of Goldilocks procedure over that lump to make that lump a rounder, smoother mound, um, but I don't know for sure that I'm gonna do that. I might just leave it as it is and deal with it, live with it.
So we'll see. I will tell you, of course, as uh, um, as my journey comes to an end in the next few months after I have my, my second mastectomy. But those are the six or seven things that I really wish that I had known about Goldilocks procedures ahead of time. And I hope that learning about them helps you in your journey with breast cancer or preventative mastectomy. And I'll see you in my next video. Take care.